Hey guys, so in this video we're going to be talking about two essential cofactors, super important. Uh, the first is going to be B12 and the second is folate. Um, just a little disclaimer, I am going to be discussing some stuff that you guys don't quite need to know for class yet, but I do think it gives you a better understanding of why B12 and why folate are important. Um, we're going to be looking at a very simple drawing of the citric acid cycle, which is actually right in front of you right now. Um, in a minute we're going to be looking at the folate cycle and then the methionine cycle. So just keep in mind that you don't actually have to know those details quite yet, but I'm just giving you them so you can have a better understanding of the importance of B12 and folate. So we're starting with B12. So in front of you is the citric acid cycle, also known as TCA, also known as Krebs cycle. And I'm assuming that you guys probably know the classic way that substrates enter the citric cycle through acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA is a product of pyruvate, which comes from glycolysis. It can also um, be a product of several different amino acids, and it can also come from fatty acids. So there's many different ways in which things can go to acetyl-CoA and enter the citric acid cycle. However, there's actually various different ways that things can enter the citric acid cycle. Acetyl-CoA is only one of them. Another way, which is relevant to B12, is through succinyl-CoA. So succinyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle through methylmalonyl-CoA. Methylmalonyl-CoA is um, transformed into succinyl-CoA via an enzyme called methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. Methylmalonyl-CoA mutase can only work in the presence of B12. So B12 is a coenzyme to methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. So if you're B12 deficient, Methylmalonyl-CoA mutase cannot work, therefore you cannot take methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA. Now additionally, we have four amino acids that can actually be converted to methylmalonyl-CoA through a series of steps. These are valine, methionine, isoleucine, and threonine. So not only can we not just take methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA if we have a B12 deficiency, but we're also unable to take these four amino acids to methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA. So now we have one less way that we are able to enter the citric acid cycle. So definitely if you have a B12 deficiency, you're going to have problems just because you have less substrates for the citric acid cycle. Now, the second way that B12 is important is actually in conjunction with folate. So over here we have the folate cycle, super simple drawing, um, and then over here we have another simple drawing of the methionine cycle, and then in the middle is just how B12 kind of connects these two cycles. So folate gets turned to THF, which is, stands for tetrahydrofolate, which is essentially just folate with some more hydrogens thrown in there. And then tetrahydrofolate will go through the folate cycle and eventually get turned into something called methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is literally just tetrahydrofolate with an added methyl group. This is important now because now our tetrahydrofolate is acting as a methyl carrier and donor. So now our methyl tetrahydrofolate is going to donate its methyl group to B12. B12 is going to pick up that methyl group as shown right here and now B12 can subsequently donate its methyl group that it just picked up to homocysteine. Homocysteine is then going to get changed into methionine. Methionine is just homocysteine with an added methyl group. Now methionine can go to SAM and SAM can go back to homocysteine and the cycle can continue. Now B12 and folate aren't important in that they are going to directly go be these essential products. However, they are essential in that they are necessary to transfer these methyl groups to homocysteine to create methionine so we can get SAM, which later you'll learn goes on to create, um, or it's involved in the creation of neurotransmitters. And homocysteine is involved in something called the transsulfuration process, which is used to make something called GSH, which is essential an essential reducing factor. So B12 and folate aren't directly essential in this pathway that we're talking about, but they are essential in that they make things that are going to be extremely important um, in some content that you will learn later on. 
Um, one thing I do want to say before moving on is the folate cycle. So something I didn't put on this slide, but I do think is important. I didn't want to make the diagram too complex for you guys, but the folate cycle is also essential for crea the creation of purines and pyrimidines. Um, again, I didn't show this on the diagram, but it's really important to know and it's going to help you understand megaloblastic anemia in just a second. Um, so B12 and folate not only are important in the creation of methionine, SAM, and homocysteine, but they're also extremely important in the creation of purines and pyrimidines, and thus they're important in the creation of DNA. So megaloblastic anemia results from a folate deficiency and a B12 deficiency. And how this works is so essentially what I told you is that folate and B12 are necessary for DNA production. Now, if you don't have DNA production, you're actually going to end up being stuck in this um, phase of the cell cycle. So here is just a super simple drawing. Now you don't need to know what all of these phases mean yet, but the G2 phase is the growth phase, the M phase is the mitotic phase. So here cells are gonna be dividing and multiplying, and here cells are gonna be growing and getting larger. And if you have no DNA, you cannot go through mitosis and and therefore, you will be stuck in what is known as the G2 phase um, or just continuously growing. So that's, that's how we're going to get these megaloblastic, macrocytic cells because we're stuck in this G2 phase and these cells just continue to grow. And you can see how just how large they are by comparing them to the cells around them. So all of these are normal size red blood cells, but these uh, megaloblastic anemia cells are just huge. And it's because there's no DNA because we're deficient in B12 or we're deficient in folate or deficient in both. And now we do not have the folate cycle and we cannot create purines and we cannot create pyrimidines and now we cannot create DNA. And now we're stuck in this phase. Um, one last thing I wanted to say is that B12 deficiency can result in a number of different things. Parietal cells secrete something called intrinsic factor, and intrinsic factor is essential for absorbing B12. So if you don't have parietal cells or you don't have intrinsic factor, you will not be able to absorb B12, and therefore you are going to result in megaloblastic anemia. Now this is a really common problem with alcoholics. So alcoholism actually destroys the stomach lining. It damages the parietal cells. They can no longer secrete intrinsic factor and thus they can no longer absorb B12. So a lot of times alcoholics will result in a B12 deficiency and eventually end up with megaloblastic anemia. Now the liver does store uh, around six years of B12. So a lot of times it will be numerous years before an alcoholic will start showing symptoms of megaloblastic anemia. That's all I had for you guys in this video. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment or message me directly. Thank you.